from December 11, 2013, the following is a discussion on redistricting reform in North Carolina, held in Apex by the North Carolina Coalition for Lobbying and Government Reform. Speaking first is Jane Pinsky, Director of the Coalition. Appreciate you all coming and giving us a little extra time so the people who got stuck in the horrible traffic could get here. Um, I especially want to thank you. I should start. I'm Jane Pinsky. I'm Director of the North Carolina Coalition for Lobbying and Government Reform. <coughs> I didn't name the coalition, it's not my fault. <laughs> and uh, one of these days I'm gonna have a contest to come up with a, a shorter name. Um, but this is redistricting reform, nonpartisan redistricting, is an issue that I've been working on since I started the coalition in 2007. And the coalition started it long before I got there, from the day it started in 2004. Um, and I wanna be very clear that this is an issue that we think has nothing to do with party politics. We wanted to change when the Democrats were in control. We want to change now that the Republicans are in control. It is not about parties, it's about citizens and our right to choose our elected officials. Um, with all due, um, no disrespect to Representative Stam and Mayor Weatherly, in Illinois they say it's our turn to have the crayons. So, <laughs> um, but I do want to start by asking Keith Weatherly to come up and welcome us to his town of Apex. You should know that his father, along with Representative Stan, were some of the people who early on pushed nonpartisan redistricting reform, um, not in 1995, 1997. And um, Keith has told me it's one of the things his father regretted most was not being able to move the bill. He's been incredibly helpful, and so I'll turn this over to him. Thank you, Jane, and I appreciate you bringing the coalition to the peak of good living. This is a great crowd. This is a wonderful interest in a really important topic and maybe the most critical issue that uh, the legislature will be dealing with for a while for the future of the integrity of politics in our state. Uh, I do welcome each of you here. and appreciate your interest in this, uh, this important topic. I'm not gonna miss the opportunity to tout our little town. Uh, Money Magazine in October released their list of best places to live in America, and Apex was the only town in North Carolina to make that list. And, and we were in the top ten nationally. So Apex has a lot to offer, and I hope when you leave, you'll go to the track, cross the tracks, turn left at the light, and and view our historic district down Salem Street. There'll be plenty of places open for you to eat after this meeting's over, so spend some money here if you will. But, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate your interest in, in Jane and her traveling road show. We chose to bring it to Apex, and we're going to hear from Representative Stan. But this, uh, this bill, the current bill, has 61 of the 120 co-sponsors in the House to the credit of Representative Stan. Apex is on Representative Sam, the Speaker Pro Tem of the House, and he is the chief sponsor of that bill. Worked very hard to get those sponsors. <coughs> You'll have a very informative and great uh, program tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, as we get started, I want to recognize two of my colleagues are here. Jay Gladio, who's the man at the projector, who's the project director for this and Bob Phillips, who's on my board, he's the Director of Common Cause. Um, and I am especially glad that you're all here because Bob told me there was no way people were gonna turn out on a Wednesday <laughs> night, two weeks before Christmas, and I was gonna be sorry that I had picked tonight. So thank you all very much. And I'll be soliciting things for all, from all of you when he does my next evaluation at work. <laughs> next, I wanna bring up Representative Paul Stewart. Um, we've been recognizing legislators across the state for their work on this issue, but there is nobody who deserves recognition more than Representative Stan. He started working on this issue in 1989, and he has kept at it, and kept at it, and kept at it. Um, and I have to say that, as, as I was thinking about tonight, I, I thought of a quote I heard them say that was Nelson Mandela's, which is, a thing is impossible until it is done. So this bill may be impossible now, but the day we get it passed, it will no longer be impossible. So let me invite up Representative Paul Stan. Um, Thank you, Jane. First of all, I want to give you this. Oh, of course, For all yes. the, it's 
recognition of all your help and for all the hours that we've harassed well, Keith thank and Anne. Thank you. <laughs> and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Becky. Yep. And all y'all, um, I'd like to give you just a little bit of brief history and then explain why this will prevail in, uh, in the future, uh, but then what the, some of the obstacles are. Uh, I did the first bill on this. Uh, I asked my clerk to get all the bills over the last few years, and it's, this, this file is this big. <laughs> and I'm not going to go over them all, but the uh, first start was in 89 when I was a little freshman in the house. And I'll tell you what, why I didn't go anywhere in 89. It's because everybody knew who was going to win the election of 1990. And so therefore, it was too close to the next census and redistricting. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Uh, this bill can only pass when both each party does not know who will win the election <laughs> immediately preceding the next census. The next census is in 2020, and so at a certain point, each party will be in equipoise and not know, and then they'll say, well, this is not the best thing, but it will present, prevent disaster. <laughs> so that's why the one in 89 didn't go forward. Uh, after my seatmate was uh, John Weatherly, Keith's father, and the voters of my district believed in term limits and they defeated me at the polls. <laughs> so I turned over my files to John Weatherly. I said, John, please get this done. And he sure tried. He was on study commissions. Here's a bill from 95, 96, when John was the uh, uh, chief sponsor, and I think the uh, League, of Munis League of Women's Voters worked with him on it, and possibly Common Cause, I'm not sure. And that was far enough away from a uh, redistricting that I think it had a chance. Uh, try again, here's a 99, 2001, uh, too close to the census for that one. But here was 97 with John Webley, uh, still trying. And some of these are constitutional amendments, and some of them are statutes. And some of the people who believe the statute's the way to go, uh, they don't like the constitutional amendment, and some of the people who like the constitutional amendment, they don't like the statute. So they all have good reasons. But until they get together and decide that, well, the, the best is the enemy of the good, and so we'll go with what we, we can get past. Uh, it's hard to, hard to pass things like this. Uh, then 2001-2002, uh, Art Pope, chief sponsor. You ever heard of Art Pope? <laughs> <laughs> Becky, I'll give you an autograph. I was autographed, there. I was uh, there. Copy there. Uh, and then uh, 2003, 2010 session. Now, what's wrong with that one? <laughs> Too close to the census. But I remember a press conference when I told the I was minority leader at that time of the House, and I told the Democrats, I said. Vote for it this year because you're going to wish you had. <laughs> but they sent it to a committee and never did anything, and they wish they had. Boy. Uh, then in the 11-12 session, the House actually passed one, a statutory version. And let me tell you why I don't think the Senate will pass one uh, last year or this year. Uh, it's a concern that I don't share, but is very real to them. And that is, as long as the litigation concerning the current redistricting is in the courts, some of them are fearful that the existence of this law with the commission will prompt some court somewhere to say, oh, you could have done a commission and therefore your maps are no good. You see what I'm saying? That's uh, sketchy, but that's their excuse. Um, then, this year, we didn't get a vote, but we had 61 sponsors, which is the majority of the House, including much of the uh, House leadership, and we could pass it, but the reluctance there is if you know the Senate is not going to pass something, why do you uh, spend time on the floor, you know, taking up two hours of debate, making people upset with each other, no, 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 no. So, the... Uh, Opportunity, I believe, will be when that litigation is over, which could, could happen in the next year or, or the next few months, and when each party is unsure of who will win 
the election of 2020. Now, I'd just like to digress a little bit to tell you that there are some things that this uh, legislation will do and some that are not. What it will do, and I think this is what Jane is talking about, it's our turn with the pencil, right? right. <laughs> what it will do is make it more difficult for the legislators to pick their voters, but instead allow the voters to pick the legislators. The reason I say that, of course, is because computers now and the uh, ability to use them make it so much easier than it used to be to create districts that will favor particular people because you know a lot more about people through big data and things like that than you used to know. You, you know what magazines they subscribe to, you know what their incomes are, of course the demographic things. So you're able to make that uh, decision a lot more precisely. But because of that, here's one thing it will not do. Um, I think when I was first did this and was elected for one term in 80, 88, I was just, I didn't like the maps. They were not pretty to me. They didn't look like things that uh, rational people would draw. You know? They just looked like ink spots. Um, with, the, with the new use of computer, over 20 years, the more sophisticated use of data means that you can have a completely gerrymandered districts that are prettier than ones that are not. Because you can be more precisely know what people do, so you can do a prettier map. The main reason why maps are ugly is not that um, <coughs> you know politicians are trying to get this voter or that voter or whatever. It's the Voting Rights Act. And our North Coast Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court have said that if you can create majority-minority districts, you have to do it. And a lot of places you can do that. And you can do it a lot more precisely now, and that's the reason for most of the jiggle tags. This kind of thing will not get rid an independent redistricting commission or nonpartisan staff, whatever the mechanism is, will not get rid of ugly maps. There are other things that create ugly maps. Can I just give one example? So I live right on the edge of my district here in Apex, Hunter Street. My wife, uh, her in-laws live two or three miles out of town on a 40-acre par uh, parcel. Uh, they're very elderly. So I saw the map that was drawn for me, and I said, well, it cuts out my son and daughter up there, it cuts out my son and daughter over there, and it cuts out my <coughs> in-laws. Well, I didn't mind losing my sons and daughters. But the problem with my in-laws is that they're very elderly, and my wife keeps talking about moving out there to take care of them. <laughs> but under that map that I first saw, if I moved out there with my wife, I would lose my seat in the house. So we did a little squiggle, took in about eight more people, and now I wouldn't lose my seat in the house if I went with my wife. You know what I'm saying? Uh, things like that happen a lot, and sometimes they break precinct lines. You know, people think breaking precinct lines is the ultimate sin, but they're often done for very practical reasons like that. And the maps will be just as ugly visually if this passes. Now, I've said enough. Do you want me to answer a question or two? Yes. Do people I'll have do questions? There, there is. Go ahead. You, you call on them. By ugly, do you mean you're weird shapes? Shapes. Expand, expand shapes. In weird right. Ways. What we want to get away from is the politicians choosing their voters. But this kind of system will do that, will do that, but it will not do away with the visually ugly maps unless the Voting Rights Act is repealed, which I doubt will happen. So uh, as a citizen, how does this uh, approach help you? If you are able to change the map to, your, to the, to the uh, representative benefit, how it's helping? Well, as, as a citizen, as a vote. 
One for me. Uh, three ways. Primarily, it would be more. There would be more competitive districts. There would be more districts where there was a true race between the Republican and the Democrat. Uh, as of today, there's only a in the House. You know, there are a couple of dozen competitive seats, but under this kind of system, there might be four dozen competitive seats. So it gives you a bigger choice. And it, the second thing it, it does is um, it, it doesn't insulate somebody with a lot of seniority from a challenge. Our current system allows people with a lot of seniority to get maps drawn for their own benefit. Yeah, the ostensible reason is that we get, there's litigation still ongoing. Now, the Justice Department already approved our maps. The three-judge Superior Court, which was majority Democrat, unanimously approved the maps. But that is on appeal to the state Supreme Court, and there is a federal district court right. challenge to the maps as well. So they are concerned that if legislation like what we had passed two years ago passed, creating an independent uh, or nonpartisan commission, that a court would be more inclined to say, we find some problem, we send it back to a commission, instead of what they would have to do today, is we find some problem, we just send it back to you to, to try again. That's the difference. Yes, ma'am. In your speech, you said, you made a statement that I didn't understand. I was wondering if you could explain it for me, please. You said that the state and federal voter registration act mandates that we must have districts of majorities and minorities. Could you please elaborate on that? So yes, it's the Federal Voting Rights Act yes. of 1965. Both the North Carolina Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court have held in a case that came out of Pender County that if the map makers can draw districts that create a majority people who are of a minority race, <coughs> that the map makers have to do that. That's absurd. I'm sorry. I've never heard that before. I, I find that to be. It is. I agree. It's absurd. Um, but we have to follow federal law, or we just stay in court forever. Basically, it was to prevent, protect the rights of people who had been discriminated against by the state of North Carolina and several other states in the past. Dennis, did you? Uh, we have 40 counties that are covered by the Voting Rights Act. Yes. Or uh, not now. No. That was just struck down. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a preference between a statute or an amendment? They each have uh, advantages. The one I did in 89 was a constitutional amendment. Uh, the one we introduced this year was a statute. Uh, there's the advantage of a statute is it only takes a majority to pass it. The advantage of a constitutional amendment is you can't change it in the in the year before the in the year after the census when your party has a majority <laughs> and you realize you're going to lose. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Nonpartisan staff, how is that selected? Who are, how are those people selected? Well, that's the, the statute. The, the statute in our latest bill has a nonpartisan staff proposing a bill, and then the assembly has to either pass it with no amendment or not. And they have to try again. Okay. Uh, we have about 300 people on the nonpartisan staff of the assembly. And then there's partisan staff like Keith Weatherly there. <laughs> but there are very, very, very few of them. <laughs> but they're selected by their predecessors. And, you know, they're just employed. But, the, but they would be given specific criteria that they had to fit. Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Stam, 
the, the, the field is it specifically addressed what's in the database that is used by the nonpartisan group. One of my concerns has been with the advent we have in software, simply removing party from the voter file that's used to create the district would seem to be a major breakthrough. Yeah, one of the one of the things you can't consider is where the incumbent lives. But 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 would would political party be in the database used by the nonpartisan no. staff? The, no. When we talk about the bill, you'll see that there are some things they cannot consider, which is where the incumbent or a challenger lives. Say, I recruit somebody to run from Wilson County, and I want to draw the district so they can be in it. You can't do that. It, you cannot look at the voting patterns in the past. You cannot look at voter registration. You cannot look at partisan makeup. Um, and, and I promise we will get to that. Let a couple more people yeah, ask questions. Yeah, other people will just, yeah, a couple more questions and I'll give up. Go ahead. Um, hey, I've got to say this. All right, it's been 23 years we've been working on this, right? Mm -hmm. Last session, 24. I got a bill passed that I've been working on for 30 years. <laughs> and the session before, I got a bill that I've been working on for 40 years. I'm not hanging around for another one. <laughs> you only have to go five more to get you. Okay, great. Um, if both houses pass this, would there be any reason for the people to continue the lawsuits, uh, or would they just drop them? Well, the lawsuits relate to the 2010 census, and the bill relates to the 2020 census. So, yeah, they would keep keep at it. We're not allowed to redistrict any more often than once every 10 right. years, once unless every... ordered by a court, right? Right, right. Under our Constitution, right. you know, there are some states where that's not true. But... There have two questions, really. One is, and this is not just here in North Carolina, but in so many states where gerrymandering is permitted by the party in power. How did, I understand the Voting Rights Act, but how then did that somehow become just the party in power got to decide all of this? That's one question. And the other is, is that, is there any way in this state that there could be an online petition of citizens with enough power to tell the legislatures that we want this as a constitutional amendment? Well, certainly you can do petitions. Uh, North Carolina being one of the original colonies uh, does not have uh, initiative and referendum in its constitution. Uh, those are mostly western states where that was a, a good idea in the early, early 20th century. And so we don't have that as a mechanism Certainly you could have, I mean, this is the petition right here, Jane Pitts. Uh, actually, yeah. all of you are the petition because as... I mean, you're the petition collector. Right. As right. Representative right. Stam and, and Mayor Weatherly will tell you, if you talk to your legislators enough, they will get the idea that you right. want something done. And, and a couple more are on the way. I just, I saw them before I came. A couple more legislators. Good, good. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Well, thank you very much for having me. That's, that's for Jane. Oh, okay. good. Thank you. Um, we'll try and answer all your questions in the course of the next approximately hour. We promise not to keep you too late. Let me start by introducing a few people. Our panel up here is Becky Gray, who's on the staff of the John Locke Foundation. Um, and Becky's been working with me on this for several years now. Um, and she has the scars to prove it. <laughs> Kristen Byler, who's a teacher here in Wake County, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, she's going to talk a little bit about why it matters to teachers. And Dennis Hoadley, who's with uh, AARP, who's going to tell you why a group that you might think may not have a reason to care about redistrict reform does. Um, there are some other people here. We have Larry King and Dennis Burns from Common Cause. Mary Bethel from AARP, and these people have all also been working long and hard um, on, on <coughs> issues, so you can feel free to, to ask them questions. So here's the way tonight's going to go. We're going to do a little bit of an introduction, then we're going to talk about what the problem is, why redistricting matters, um, and you'll be free to ask questions after that segment. Then we'll talk about some solutions, and you'll be free to ask questions after that segment. 
And we're going to talk about what you can do to be the petition. Um, and there will be time for questions there. And if you still have questions when the program's over, we'll be happy to stay and answer them for you or give you a way to contact any of us so that we can answer them. Joe, so you want to go ahead and put the program on? Um, I, I, I promise not to, to talk too much, but we're going to try and do this quickly so that So redistricting is something that North Carolina has never done well. Um, and to ask, answer your question about gerrymandering, the first gerrymandering was in approximately 1812. It was a district in Massachusetts um, drawn by Elbridge Gerry. That is not the right. Gerry. Gerry, right. <laughs> right. And, and I always like to talk about it because it's a district that I lived in when I was growing up. Yeah, we'll, we'll just make do. Will you go back to the Let's, agenda for a second? Sure. Excuse me. Um, so here's what we're going to do tonight. Why does redistricting matter? What is the problem? How can we fix it? And how can you help? So why does redistricting matter? Redistricting matters because who represents you is your voice in government. And that's very important. And Becky and Kristen and Dennis are going to tell you why they think it matters. Go ahead, Jay. Um, it, it, it is the, the heart of what makes us a representative democracy. Again, redistricting is the connection between voters' preference and elected officials. Redistricting now is a broken process. You've all seen that. Um, anybody here remember the government shutdown in October? <laughs> Okay, that is a sign of why redistricting is, is needed, why changing redistricting is needed. Um, there are, out of the 435 people in the U.S. House, only 13 seats that are truly competitive. There are probably another 20 seats that are almost competitive. And the 13 seats that are truly competitive are seats where the margin of victory was more than 10 points. So everything else was closer than that. And there are some districts, including some in North Carolina, where, where the winner won by 60 points, it's 20 to 80. That's not a competitive district. We don't get people who work hard for our vote, and we don't get people who listen to us when they're in office. Um, we've always had partisan redistricting. This is the 12th congressional district as it was drawn in 1992. It stretched from Durham to Charlotte. Now it cuts off at Greensboro. Okay, 12 of our 13 congressional districts are not competitive. Only one, the one that's currently being held by Mike McIntyre, is truly competitive. 159 out of our 170 legislative seats are not competitive. And again, this is a race where someone won by 10 points or more, double digits. What's the difference between congressional and legislative? Co congressional is people, we love 13 people to the United States Congress, and then there are 120 members of the North Carolina House who represent you in Raleigh, and 50 North Carolina senators. So, um, and the North Carolina legislature <coughs> redistricts both Congress and itself. Um, and just so you no, although we're just talking about Congress and, and the legislature tonight, every representative body in the state redistricts every 10 years. So if it's school board, county commissioners, city council, they have to redistrict because in the 1960s our court said that basically one person, one vote. You couldn't have one district with 100,000 people and one district with 20,000 people. It didn't work. So this is what our congressional districts look like. Um, if you think about getting to meet your congressman, if you live over here in this district, you may have to chase a long way. If you live here in the triangle where we live, it might not be so far. And that's part of having a representative government. So what do uncontested seats in the General Assembly mean to you? They mean legislators and members of Congress. The people's court of power. Okay. We'll do this. In order to keep themselves in power, they 
were given the rules to draw the lines of the competition. You know, we wouldn't want the University of North Carolina in a basketball game to have the referee be uh, the chancellor at uh, Chapel Hill when they're playing to Even I would think that's inappropriate, but that's essentially what we have now. A fair redistricting process increases uh, the competitiveness of districts, which means that candidates have to reach out more to voters. They have to articulate uh, answers to problems better uh, than if they are an automatic winner uh, based upon a guaranteed redistricting uh, process. Uh, the Democrats uh, used gerrymandering and to say that or the Republicans have sort of perfected it and gone to the next level where we now we really don't have legislative bodies or congressional delegation that are representative of where the people of North Carolina are. And that's, that's predominantly because we have politicians drawing maps, using computers, hiring experts to draw the maps for partisan gain, not for equal representation. So in my mind, regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you're sitting in the General Assembly in 2013, you want to consider redistricting reform to ensure that no matter what happens in the 2020 election, your party is not going to be artificially reduced to power, which is what redistricting does. Seems to me you ought to do that by redistricting reform that takes it out of the hands of partisan line drawers. It is very possible to draw maps that uh, intend to uh, disadvantage one side or the other unduly. So I've always supported an independent redistricting commission. Well, I think one of the things that we see on the national level and the state level right now is uh, way too much polarization of the parties um, uh, in, in their relationships and in, uh, really affecting and diminishing their ability to solve problems. Uh, that is a direct outgrowth of uh, very partisan redistricting that has occurred in, in, uh, on behalf of both parties over a number of decades here. And there's simply a better way to do that and a better way to get um, uh, for lack of a better term, I think, but, but more moderate um, solution um, uh, based legislators. And we can come up with some system that is nonpartisan or people can have confidence in and trust. It's all about building trust of, for, among the people in their government it's, uh, and not giving an unusual advantage to anybody. So there, from some experts, are reasons why um, <coughs> we need to care about redistricting now and we need to have reforms. We're going to stop here for a minute and let Dennis and Kristen and, and Becky tell you about why they think it's important. And then we are open to any of your questions before we move on. Becky, you want to start? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here, Jane. As always, thank you for the invitation for the John Locke Foundation to participate in this. Um, <clears throat> again, just a couple of quick points. You know, as you've heard from the, the slideshow and also from Representative Stam, um, this is not a new problem. It's been going on for, you know, 140 years. Um, politicians draw maps of who's voting for them. It just doesn't make sense. It's not part of our representative government. And this goes back to what was put through in our Constitution, this guarantee of one man, one vote. That's why every 10 years, the census of the entire country is taken. Those numbers are then used to determine how many people live in North Carolina. And that's how they then divide, you know, they take like all the people in the United States and divide that by the number of congressional seats and then they apportion those congressional seats based on those congressional numbers. They do the same thing within North Carolina. You know, sir, to your question, there's 120 House seats. So they take the whole 9 million, 9 million plus people that live in North Carolina, divide that by 120, and that's how many people are supposed to live. And there's a little bit of a, a give and take with that. Um, 
And then the same thing for the, for the North Carolina Senate. There are 50 Senate seats. They take all the people in North Carolina for that 10-year period, divide it by 50, and that's how many people are in each of those seats. So that's what this whole thing is about, is this guarantee of one man, one vote. But what we've gotten to, when you allow politicians to draw their own maps, that gets away from that, and then they are not guaranteeing one man, one vote. They are guaranteeing that they get the votes that they need to be elected. And it's just not the way that we, that, that we believe that it should be done. Um, I work for the John Locke Foundation. We are very proud to be part of this. I, I don't even think it's a bipartisan group. It's a multi-partisan group. Yes. Um, and, and we have been part of the group as long as it's been going on. Um, we are a public policy think tank. Um, we are probably lean to the right, um, you know, in this whole world of the, um, the coalition. Um, we believe in limited government. We believe in representative government. We believe in debate and lots of talking. And, you know, I work for, at a think tank. We think the more research that you do and the more ideas that are on the table, the better that end product is. And that certainly goes at the very heart of what elections are all about. Um, so when we're talking about reform, what we're really talking about is to improve voter information so that you know who represents you. Um, you know, with some of these crazy districts that you see and the way they're, they're drawn, sometimes it's hard. I mean, does everybody here know who their congressman is, who their member of the House of Representatives Representatives and who their North Carolina Senate senator is, is, you know, you should, but everybody should have that information. It ought to be easy to figure out. Uh, we also ought to try to foster competition, to make people work for that vote. Again, to put all those ideas on the table, to see whose ideas are better, whose best suit your needs. To, again, to foster the competition. And then to break up the insularity of the state's political class so that you don't have 140 years of domination by one particular party or another 20 years you know there really does there is a better government there's a better result when we have that give and take and it goes back and forth with a lot of discussion and a lot of debate on the table um, voters must retain the ultimate sovereignty in any kind of representative government I think it was Bill Kobe in the the clip talked about building trust and having integrity in system in the voting system that we have you know one thing that is always struck me within our voting system is even in the really big election, the big presidential year election, the actual percentage of people who participate in our voting process is very low. And then if you look at some of the municipal, some of the smaller elections that are held, often it's two, three, four percent of the voting public that participates in our voting system. And I just don't know how we continue to assure that we have a good, strong system in this country if we don't have more participation. And in order to get that, I think that people need to feel that there is an integrity built into the system and that their one vote does make a difference. Um, <clears throat> so redistricting reform is a worthy cause. It is something that we've been working on. But one thing that I really want to point out, and you've heard um, – the independent commission and how some other states do it and that we ought to do it in a different way than allowing legislators to draw the congressional maps and the legislative maps. But what I would suggest to you is that creating an independent commission is not redistricting reform. What we're really talking about redistricting reform is the rules that are in place that control how that redistricting is done. Because unless you have the really fair, really firm, really strong rules in place, it doesn't matter who's drawing them, you know, if there's that leeway that's given. So that's what we suggest that we really look at and that we really focus on is putting those rules so that the process is ensured to be integrity and everything else that we want it to. Now, what we've seen through the years, and I think North Carolina is, if it is not the most litigated state in the country, it is one of the most litigated states in the country when it comes to redistricting. Um, and so what we've seen here is the courts through the years have begin, begun to establish some of those rules for us. And some of the things that they've looked at, part of it is the Voting Rights Act that was set up in the 1960s. And again, that was to address um, discriminatory voting. And um, Congress then has voted to continue the Voting Rights Act a number of times. So North Carolina, like many southern states, do have to comply with the Voting Rights Act. So there's that part of it. That's one of the rules that we know that is in place. Um, <coughs> county, using county lines um, to try to keep the voting districts within the county lines is another rule that's sort of been um, 
progress through the courts. And then to keep the districts as compact as you can, to keep communities of interest together so that voters who represent, who elect a certain representative will represent all of those voters within that district. Um, now, there's no such decisions like this that mandate congressional maps. Some of the compactness and the county lines are not on there. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to look at is for criteria and data-driven rather than politically-driven decisions that are made. And so sort of the good news of having all the computer programs and the software and all the information that you can put together, you know, kind of the bad news is it makes it easier for those legislators to pick their voters, but it also gives us a lot more detailed data that we can use to draw those districts that are more honest and more open and more like we want it to be. So that's kind of how we see the problem at, at the John Locke Foundation. It's something that we have worked on. We are um, celebrating our 24th year in North Carolina in February, and I believe this has been part of our agenda for the entire 24 years that we have been in existence. So it's something that we'll continue to work on. We're committed to it as well. So I think I'll stop and okay. pass along to Kristen. Kristen. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me here tonight. My name is Kristen Beller, and I'm a fourth grade teacher in Raleigh. Um, I was born and raised in Raleigh, and I have been through Wake County Public Schools, and um, went and got my bachelor's at Appalachian, and came back here to, to teach. And um, as I started teaching, you know, I was not politically minded. I didn't know what was going on. I had full faith that whoever was making decisions was going to make the right ones for me. And, you know, as you, as you, go, you grow up and you um, gain experience, you realize, I need to have my voice out there and I need to make sure that decisions are being made they are going to benefit my students. Um, as an educator, my number one priority when I go to a poll is always going to be um, getting my students the best quality education that they deserve and what and electing the people that are that are going to do that for them and so gerrymandering really when you when you think about the competition that is lacking in our districts it takes away the voters right to voice their opinions to, to voice their needs and that impacts the schools in a very big way the the students and our parents start to you know lose faith if they don't feel like their voice is being heard through their vote and so that's why we um, as educators believe that having competitive districts is so important is to make sure that our votes are being counted and that our voices are being heard um, without competition politicians really don't have any reason to listen to their constituents you know and that's that's a very big problem democracy is the, the foundation of our society and for true democracy democracy to happen we have to have competition within our districts so um, and all of that is linked back to education you know when we, I'm a fourth grade teacher so we teach North Carolina government mm -hmm. and uh, as we're, we're talking about you know how governments run oh my goodness kids they, they are observant you know and they say well I don't think that's the way it's happening. <laughs> no, you know, the, the democracy is a, is a cycle. And um, when you become 18, you're going to have a vote too. And so it's important that uh, voters and even people who are not voters yet, potential voters, feel that there's a, they have confidence in our system and in our democracy and that the, the people who are representing them are representing them accurately. And if they're not, they have a chance to represent, to elect someone else. And without that confidence in the system, we lose the whole sense of democracy in our state. And that's a, a very big, big issue in education. We, we believe in democracy at all levels, so. Thank you. Kristen. Dennis? Well, good evening. <laughs> My name's Denny Hoadley. Uh, I'm a GM manufacturing executive, uh, retired, been retired for nigh on 16 years now. And I currently volunteer with the uh, AARP and I'm uh, one of six members of the North Carolina AARP Executive Council. Uh, I, I welcome the opportunity to uh, so show AARP support uh, for the North Carolina Coalition for Lobbying and Government Reform, and I certainly am very pleased to have the opportunity to make some brief comments tonight. AARP believes that the current practice for drawing legislative and congressional districts in North Carolina needs to be changed for a number of reasons. 
First, as you've heard from both of the other speakers, voters are detached from their legislatures <coughs> and fellow constituents by districts that are spread out and whose boundaries are very confusing to say the least. While this is a smart group and nobody raised their hand tonight when we asked how many people knew all of their representatives, senators, federal and national, most of the people that we contact uh, generally have some knowledge but not 100% of who, who represents them. And the process that we currently have for drawing the districts has resulted in these oddly shaped spread out districts and as a consequence you can't uh, blame the voters <coughs> for being disengaged from their elected officials. <clears throat> Excuse me. One-sided districts lead to the election of candidates who may not be as reflective of the general population of their district. The minority party concedes races in districts who may not be as reflective, I'm sorry, uh, who they are likely to lose. There ends up being no choice or viable option at the ballot box. Legislatures and members of Congress who are protected by safe seats may have little interest in pursuing policies that help their constituents and may be less willing to compromise on issues. In this day and time when there are major policy de decisions being made about programs that affect so many of our senior citizens, such as areas as Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, taxes, energy costs, it's crucial that we elect, that those we elect are there for our constituents and are held accountable to them. We strongly support a redistricting system that takes the process of drawing legislative and congressional districts out of the hands of those who have a vested interest in the process. The process for drawing districts should be nonpartisan, independent, and transparent. Redistricting should result in districts that have equal populations in accordance with the federal constitutional standards, comply with the Voting Rights Act requirements on protecting minority populations, are contiguous, show respect of the communities of interest, city and county borders, and are visible geographic features, and finally are geographically compact. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. We're going to take a couple of questions on the, the problem, and um, I want to recognize Representative Tom Murray, who's one of the supporters of the bill. Representative Murray, if you want to come up here and help us answer questions. Um, Representative Murray is one of the 61 co-sponsors of this bill, and, and I have to brag and say there are also probably another 10 members of, of the North Carolina House who support the bill. and. In order to be a co-sponsor, you've got to get your name in on time, and they didn't get their name in on time. But if people have questions about the problem or anything you've heard so far, yes, sir. I was curious, uh, as you were just discussing the position of the legislation and all that, how many members of the legislature are sympathetic or on board with this idea, whether they're sponsors or not? I would say it's a, uh, we passed it out of the House, mm -hmm. a strong majority. Strong majority. What was the final vote in yeah. the House? When it passed out in the House, it was 88 to 27. So there's 120 members of the North Carolina House, and 88 <coughs> members of the North Carolina House voted in a bipartisan way for the bill that we're talking about. Strong majority. A strong bipartisan majority. And, and I think you can correct me if I'm not wrong, Becky, Representative. Some of those people didn't vote for the bill because they want a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. There are people in each party who don't trust the people in the other party. <laughs> so they want it in the Constitution. And they also want it to come before you as citizens so that they know you care about it. Yes, sir. What's the outlook in the Senate? I'm not in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> What's holding it in the Senate? Yeah. What's holding it? Why? That's, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. I put it on TV. Yeah. We won't see that. Yes, sir. Um, if the solution, is there, there was a uh, representative, uh, Stan said there's a legislative and a constitutional amendment or options. If you have a legislative solution now, then what's to keep the legislature from just overturning the it's recommendation and saying, oh, we don't like this, we're not going to do this? Well, they, you know? they, if it was statute, they can 
overturn the statute, but once yeah. it's a statute, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, then they have to follow the law and risk being sued. Um, I mean, you could have it passed in 2014 and then have somebody come back in 2015 and repeal it. But once it is statute, if it is statute in 2021, they would have to follow it. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I question Representative Stam's statement that uh, the majority minority districts were required by the civil rights law. That, I think that's disingenuous. My understanding of the majority minority districts is that uh, in this case Republicans were in control and they lumped all the minority people who were likely to vote Democratic into one district and yes that uh, guarantees that a minority uh, at least favorable <coughs> candidate will be elected from that district but in doing that they diluted the uh, minorities um, voting power because it increased the chance that four or five Republicans in surrounding districts would get elected. And I think that's what's really going on, and I don't buy what Representative Stam said. Can you all discuss that point? Want me to start? Sure. <laughs> um, the, the Voting Rights Act Section 5, which is currently in limbo, because the Supreme Court told Congress that it needed to redraw the guidelines, did say that you had to create districts where it would be clear that a minority candidate would win. And I can't give you chapter and verse on the law, because um, it's pages and pages and pages, but there are certain sort of percentages that are required. What you can't do is disadvantage any minority and um, I, I will say, and this is my opinion, there are parts of North Carolina where I think we have moved past that. Certainly in Cumberland County, Senator Eric Mansfield was elected from a district that was less than, a, I think, 33% minority, and he's an African American. But to guarantee that there is representation, it has to be there. The question, I believe, becomes, whether a majority minority district is 45%, 48%, 49%, 50%, and, and frankly, I'm not a lawyer, and this is a moment when I'm glad I'm not, um, but that, that's something the courts are gonna have to work out. <coughs> Representative? Uh, I know the districts that you're discussing were uh, approved and signed off <coughs> on by the uh, Obama uh, ju uh, ju Department of Justice. That's the ultimate arbiter of a district and whether it meets the standards set by the Voting Rights Act, the entity that's in charge of making sure that is the case is the U.S. Department of Justice. And the U.S. Department of Justice, Eric Holder, appointed by President Obama, signed off on the district that you're talking about. All right, we're going to take two more questions and then move on to, to the next part of the discussion. I was uh, specifically told by someone back in when that first district was created in Charlotte to Durham by an African American who worked for the U.S. Justice Department that it was created in order to have an American majority district mm -hmm. and it was pushed by the civil rights movement. Yeah, that's you're talking about Mel Watt seat. Yeah, right. the Mel Watt the Mel Watt seat district. As, as it was in as it, it, Look at that map and try to make logic out of that. You can't make logic out of any mm -hmm. map. Any, that too any but that, def, that there's more case, the there's state. more case law no about that. Ever been able to make any logic the, yeah, the other it. point on, on that district, it looks like a snake that goes up sort of in the middle of, of North Carolina. The thing that I think is interesting about that too is that district has looked like that for a number of <laughs> redistricting series you know it wasn't that that all of a sudden just this year that district looked like that that's looked like that for 30 or 40 years right and, and again it's because of the voting rights and, and um, as Becky said we think if there are strict rules for how the districts get drawn that we're going to see fewer Mel Watt districts yes sir I think the essence of, of reform is to talk about how to change things and make it better mm -hmm. and some would argue that those types of districts were there to protect 
Some would argue those types of districts were there to hurt minorities. The, the benefit of packing or compacting minority views has both effects. So there's a common sense issue that needs to be discussed. I will guarantee you that the Voting Rights Act did not intend to draw the kind of districts you see in North Carolina. And if you look at places um, like Wisconsin, like Iowa, no pun intended, Wisconsin districts look like blocks of cheese. <laughs> the state's broken into seven rectangles. And those rectangles reflect the people who live in them. And as a country, we are mostly more together than we are apart. And it is these, it is these crazy districts combined with cable TV that we self-select to, <laughs> to what we agree to, that has created this divide in the country. And if we care about our democracy, if we care about being a, a beacon in the world, we need to fix this. So I applaud the efforts that I mean, it's, very, it's a very impressive group in this room. Very strong Republicans, very strong Democrats, very progressive, very conservative people in here sharing this concern. This is, in my opinion, one of the most fundamental issues in our democracy. And if we don't address it, we have so much more to lose. Because if you can't elect people who will go to the chamber that we have built to discuss the people's business, that will listen to each other, you don't have a democracy. So I have to say thank you very much, and that was unsolicited, and I really appreciate it. Okay, this is the last one. Um, I can't imagine that there are many legitimate arguments against this bill. Um, it seems like it's just something natural that would pass. What are any of the arguments against this bill? And maybe a second part of the question, quick answer. If this bill became law, would it come into effect immediately or when the census is retaken 10 years from now? We only do redistricting every 10 years. So what we're talking yeah, about, it, it, we would talk about a 20, it would be a 2020, it wouldn't, For the we, wouldn't next we wouldn't redraw while. districts in the middle of a 10 year period, I can tell you that. You want to cause confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's happened. That's, the courts have actually forced that to happen uh, in, in some of the Democrat drawn districts in previous years um, where we had to change districts midstream which is really confusing um, but this would be a 2020 and, I, and I, I think I think there is a strong argument about whether we should make this and put this in the North Carolina Constitution because of the it's good for you but now I got the power back not so much right. and I, 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 you want to talk about disingenuous the Democrats that thought this was a bad idea when they are in power, and now they think it's a good idea now that they're now that they're not. That that's disingenuous. Well, that so, so, that's so, yeah. 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 Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I understand, and so we got it up for a vote, and it's out of the house. So like Brad Miller was in power, and certainly, and he drew a district, and he got elected uh, in the district that he created back in 2000. And now it, he's, he's out in 2010 because his district was recreated into a Republican district. You mean the district that he drew for himself in right. 2017? Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we are not, we're Some not. politics here, we redistrict, you know, and we, we want our vote to be uh, taken seriously. You know, we work right. very hard, and then we send you there, and you work and you do what you want. Okay, we are not going to get into the partisan politics okay. about this. I think the one thing we can say that everybody in this room agrees on is that the system isn't working and that we need to change it. Um, I think it takes a lot of courage for uh, legislators to say, I'm going to work on a system that may lose my seat for me. Um, but they are doing the right thing. One of the members of the General Assembly, Representative McGrady, who's from Henderson County, stood up one day at our press conference and said, um, it was the right thing to do this when the Democrats were in power. It's the right thing to do this now that we're in power. And, and I think we need to recognize that there are a lot of brave people in the legislature who can do that. If you want, Jay, we'll go on to the next section of the presentation. Um, just, if it, just, where, where do you want to pick up? We'll just pick up on meaningful reforms. Yeah. 
the way. So this is what North Carolina looks like now. <coughs> and those are our congressional districts. Okay. Um, to end gerrymandering now, partisan factors like the resident of an residents of an incumbent, <coughs> challenger, results of previous elections, <coughs> the political makeup of a district, the voter registration may not be used <coughs> to draw the districts. Um, the things that I apologize, I got my slides out of order here. But the things that need to be part of the rules are that the districts are compact, that they are contiguous. That means that you know they touch all of the district touches. There's a district in Illinois that um, goes like this, and if its narrowest part over here, it's two blocks wide, and it connects Puerto Rican citizens on one side of Chicago with Dominican and Mexican citizens on the other side with a narrow strip leaving another minority district in the middle. That's not contiguous. That's just silly. Um, it needs to respect state and federal law. As Becky said, there are two key things in North Carolina. <coughs> one is that we have to follow the Voting Rights Act and our courts mandate that at least for legislative seats we must, as much as possible, keep districts whole. Keep counties, counties whole, sorry, within a district. So that's incredibly important. And the other thing is to respect what we call communities of interest. The people who live in Apex, or the people who live in Cary, or the people who live in West Raleigh, have some community of interest. They have things that they share. They care about the same things. We don't want districts that put, um, you know, Apex, with Siler City, it wouldn't make sense. They don't have things in common. So that's what's called community of interest. A nonpartisan redistricting system must have a tight timetable. Um, the system we like the best is based on one done in Iowa. Their system takes approximately seven or eight weeks from start to finish. And that timetable is important because um, once they start doing redistricting, no other issues get covered. And what has happened in the General Assembly, and I know that um, Representative Murray can tell you this, is redistricting gets tagged on to other things. And people say, I'll vote for your redistricting plan if you vote for my bill. Or I'll vote for your bill um, if, if you draw me a seat. So we want to take the politics out of it, get redistricting done early in the session, and then move on to the other things. As Representative Murray said, our 2001 redistricting finished in 2009. We had court cases from 2001 on. And it cost us a lot of money to litigate those. And it had a lot of people moving around in districts and getting even more um, disengaged from the process. What Kristen was talking about, I call the Tinkerbell effect. I don't know how many of you remember Peter Pan with Mary Martin, but Tinkerbell is dying. If you clapped your hand, she was gonna, she was gonna live. Well, there's a Tinkerbell effect about our democracy, and that is that if citizens believe in what we're doing, our democracy can survive. So the coalition's goal is to get a bill passed by the North Carolina General Assembly and signed into law, or sent to the people to be voted on as a constitutional amendment. It would require a process, whether it is partisan staff, or an independent redistricting commission, or the legislators themselves that works by criteria hard data-driven criteria, and that gets done quickly. Um, so this is how we're going to get there. We're going to involve all of you to help educate others, reach out to the business community, and create a core of citizen activists. So let's stop for a second and see, uh, are there more questions? Um, yes. You mentioned continuous several times now. What exactly does that mean? Is that a geographic term? I don't think it is, is it? Contiguous means that it touches. Um, you can't have, you couldn't put Apex in the same district with Sanford unless you had a road to Lincoln. You that the people in your circle in Illinois have more in common. They probably have the same religion, sort of have the same opinions. I would think the people in the city in the middle of Charlotte have more in common with people in the middle of Greensboro than they do uh, dairy farm outs. Well, I agree that they would have more with someone from the dairy farm out so, in the country. Uh, I'm worried about contiguous. Well, contiguous means that, that the district touches, and I think that it is important 
because people in a community, people in Apex, may care, care a great deal about what's going to happen with uh, Route 1, whether si Route 64 is going to be expanded. Um, they may care about schools. Um, one of the ideas of the whole county provision is that our school districts, for the most part in North Carolina, are county districts. And it is important that there's representation of the county to talk but about those issues. Do you not see my point? Yeah, I do see your I point. I mean, I live in the city. <coughs> Buses are important, more important to me than they are somebody in Wake Forest. That's true. Uh, and I have the same interest as the person who lives in Middle Charlotte has. Well, you have some so, of the same interests. Pardon? You have some of the same interests. Well, but I guess you could say I have some of the same interests as everybody, and then I was going to see a bomb. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it also would be very difficult for Representative Murray to represent Cary and a district in Charlotte. We want our legislators close by so that you can catch him in the grocery store or at work or at a public forum and talk to him. So that's one of the issues is that legislators should be available. Becky, do you want anything? I don't know if you covered it well. Uh, I'm aware that um, the question, why is this bill a problem in the Senate, uh, was answered by <coughs> Paul Stam before he left. And he gave a good answer, I'm sure, but not one I understood. The question has been asked twice since he left, but not answered. Is there any way that you can explain to us why the Senate has a problem with this? For those of us who are very interested in this, would like to see this pass, but are kind of new to the issue. Um, I think Becky and Representative Murray and I can take a shot at it. Um, senators don't confide in lobbyists, and they don't confide in representatives. Um, but I think they're very concerned about change. Um, I, it has to have been very hard to have been the party out of power for 140 years and you get power and then give it up. Um, my experience, and, and I guess I would ask Becky if she feels the same way, is that the Senate is always the more cautious body um, and that they're not ready to, to rush into anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd say the House can, can be pretty conscientious. We still have some pretty bad Senate stuff. Well, I meant cautious, <laughs> but, uh, I'm sorry. But I would, uh, on the, the disingenuous nature goes two ways. There are people in the Senate in power that sponsored redistricting reform measures that are stopping it now, too. So it's a two-way street. And so uh, I, I kind of like to be for something and stick with it. I've been for this for a long time. If you're going to be for something, stick with it. And, I don't, and that's, that's what bothers me right now is that I've got, I've got friends that I supported when they were in the minority in the Senate, and now they're in the majority of the Senate, and they're not moving on an issue on which we all agree. And that, that's, that is a concern. There are 14 members of the Senate leadership who did sponsor redistricting reform bills when they were the party out of power. Um, uh, so and that's line, 14 yeah, out of 50. They support this, they're liable to lose their seat. That's what they're afraid of? Um, I think they're... I, don't think that's a, I think that's a non sequitur. But yeah. I think... Um, there are certain areas of our state where there are more Republicans. There are certain areas of our state where there are more Democrats. Just, just geography. Try to get a Republican elected in Chapel Hill. I don't <coughs> care how you draw a district in Orange County. It's going to elect a Democrat. You can draw it any however you want. It's just the, it's just the demographics. I'll, uh, I'll speculate a bit on, on this too and I don't serve in the House or the or the Senate I'm just sort of an observer I spend a lot of time down there and you know I mean the reality of this is there's nothing that is more political that occurs in the General Assembly than redistricting I mean that's the reality of it it is a very political and it has been for 140 years this is the whole history of it this ultimate is kind of what we're of yeah the mm -hmm. ultimate exercise of power is, is really what this is. And so I feel like, you know, the, the Republicans have finally gotten power after 140 years, and maybe there is some hesitancy to relinquish some of that. And again, you know, these are politically, pol politically motivated, I think is part, probably some of the answer to your question. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your honesty. I think uh, as we all go forward, the vast predominance of the population is in favor of coming up with reasonable ways to redistrict. Somehow, those 
who are in our way need to understand that their bosses, the voters, are very um, desirous of them changing their opinion. And we need to get some active uh, advocacy going that lets the senators know that there are people out there that are voting for them who want to see this pass through. And I, I guarantee if we get petitions enough and they hear enough about it, they're going to at least give it serious thought. I feel like I need to, I'm sorry, I feel like I need to back up just a minute too and just sort of, you know, as, as you were talking, I just had a, sort of an additional addendum thought, if you would, that, you know, this this sort of, um, it's not a power grab, it's a, it's a tendency to hang on to the power. You know, this is exactly why this bill hasn't passed since 1989 when um, Representative Stam said there's this hesitancy to give that power up on both sides of it, of the aisle. You know, from Republicans and Democrats. You know, we didn't get, we didn't sail this thing through when the Democrats were in charge, and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to sail it through now that Republicans are in charge. So, you know, there's there's lots of guilty parties with this. Um, so I don't mean to to insinuate in any way that one is worse than the other. I think they're both equally bad and equally well intended. Well, yeah, uh, I was, was the point of the questions for what's happening right now. Why, you know, we got the bill sponsored by the House members and overwhelmingly, but we got nothing from the Senate. It's kind of weird. Maybe that speaks to what's I think it goes back to what Becky was saying earlier about low low voter turnout, mm -hmm. low voter involvement, and we need to put pressure on our representatives and let them know that people are needing this, are watching this, and are expecting it of them, that we expect integrity, whether, you know, regardless of who's in, in power. And um, along with that, that we're going to support them, you know, once they do this. That, that that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose a seat or you are supporting your integrity. Yes. How can we find out who's for this and who's against this? Jay, will you put up that slide? We've got, We've got this. Um, we'll, we'll put up a slide for you that will show you who's for it and who's <coughs> against it. And I guess this is a perfect time to launch into what you can do. Um, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you um, have ever been down to the legislature to lobby? How many of you? Okay, how many of you have bothered to make an appointment to see your legislator? Okay, this is the Wake County delegation. It is on our website, which is on the materials that we handed out to you. And you can go on there and see um, who sponsored it. I would ask you that the people like Representative Murray and Representative Stam and Representative um, Jackson and Holly and all the other people on this list who did sponsor it deserve a thank you. Yes. We don't say thank you enough to people who do which a job that, to be honest, you could not pay me enough to do. <laughs> They're there long hours and they take a lot of grief. And the people who don't support the bill, time to tell them what you think. Um, uh, you pay their salaries, you have a right to do that. And um, you have before you a sheet that we would ask you to fill out. And if you didn't get one, I'll make sure you get one. Um, asking what you will do to help us get this passed. If we email you, could you email that list back to us? I sure can. can read a single name on okay, it. well, there's, right. um, and there's also on the handout. On, the, the, on the back of the handout is a list yeah, of this, the co sponsors. Right. <coughs> yeah, that you've got with that. No, those are just members of the House of Representatives. We have no official positions from senators. Yes, sir. Um, I was at a meeting you had last month in Raleigh, and that meeting, you made it pretty clear, at least to me, that Senator Berger was holding it up, as opposed to now I'm getting the impression that it's just not the will of the Senate yet. Well, nothing moves out of the Senate or into the Senate unless Senator Berger wants it. Um, he is the president pro tem of the Senate, and we don't have a, a method to do what's called a discharge petition in the North Carolina General Assembly where you can petition to move a bill. So if the president pro tem of the Senate or the Speaker of the House decides the bill is not going to move, it, it's pretty hard to move it. And and if I, you were to ask me what one senator you should call besides your own, I'd say Senator Berger. 
Okay, well, I'm still mystified by the concept that we don't know, you don't know, where individual senators stand on this. I mean, that's, that's what lobbying is, is all about. Um, and it seems to me that our strategy is different if we know that there's not a majority in the Senate versus if we know that there is a majority in the center, in the Senate and Filberger is sticking to the spot. Well, um, and I'll, again, I'll ask Becky, one of the things I've discovered in, in my more than, I hate to say it, 30 years of lobbying is there are a lot of ways legislators cannot answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things senators say now is, I'm not sure how I feel about that, and since it's not coming to the Senate, um, I'm not going to take a position. And I don't know about Becky, but I've heard that a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. um, former Governor Jim Martin seems to think, and Governor Martin was a Republican, that there are a number of Republican senators who would like to see the bill moved. Um, if you go to the WRAL website, you will see an interview with Governor Martin and Governor Hunt in which Governor Martin says, till we do redistricting reform, we can't solve all the, all the problems in this country. Um, I promised I would get you out by 8.30, so we'll take a couple more questions and then I do want to recognize Representative Murray. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to, uh, there, I want to make an observation. Uh, part of the problem, it's interesting that North Carolina is the most litigated redistricting state it also has the second highest uh, restrictions on ballot access. Part of the problem is the so-called two-party system. I happen to represent the Libertarian Party. I'm not even going to go there, but the fact that you have two parties that buy for control is, is causing this problem. Um, I also work with a group that is trying to do ballot action reform. We had a similar bill that passed the House uh, ballot reform bill that passed the House overwhelmingly and it's sitting in the Rules Committee on the Senate. It's not going to go anywhere because the leadership doesn't want it to go. So there is there's a built-in fear in both parties, both of major parties, of any competition from anybody except, I mean, despite what Democrats and Republicans say to each other publicly, I think in private, they're happy to just have one competitor. And when you have half of the General Assembly seats, that are basically you know, Democrat or Republican runs on the polls, they're happy with that situation. Until and unless there's enough clapping of the hands, as, as Jay mentioned, from, from average people, they will respond to that. You just, you just got to keep those cards and letters coming. Right. So um, we're, we're going to try and wrap up, and then we'll let people who need to go home go home, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Can I have just a minute? Yeah. Um, I, I'm Jay Gladio, and I, I'm working with Jane and, and Bob on this project. I spent my career in corporate life and on Wall Street. And uh, uh, I'm involved in this project because of all the opinions expressed here. This is critical for our democracy. What we, what we need in our project with the coalition and common cause uh, is some help. We need your involvement like this. We need citizen activists. Also, part of our program is to approach businesses and get business leaders to put pressure on the legislature and the Senate. One key part of what we want to complete is a demographic study, a very disciplined demographic study, projecting in after the 2020 um, census what each legislative district is going to look like. And that will give us some really hard data to approach people in the assembly to try to get them to support this bill, particularly in the next year or two, which, because of the politics, we need to do it now. We can't wait. To carry this out, the demographic study uh, is going to cost about $15,000. It's from a, a highly qualified demographer at the University of North Carolina. We need to get that done. We need a travel budget to make to do these meetings, get out to the state, and spread the word, get people um, uh, motivated and active. And we need a little bit for materials. It'd be nice if we had more handout materials, etc. So we're we're trying to raise forty thousand dollars. 
we do have uh, a foundation that will match funding that we can raise. So we can really get leverage if we get some, some help uh, people making contributions. Uh, so if, if on the forms, if you could indicate your support, if you can help us financially, we'll get this double leverage because it's going to be matched. And it will really help us carry this forward. In addition to that, we need you to, to get active on your friends, write letters to the editor, approach your, your assemblymen, your senators, do everything you can to underline the importance of this issue. It does go to the very heart of our democracy. And again, I'm a Wall Street guy. I, mean, I, I spent my whole career on Wall Street, not exactly where you necessarily expect uh, a progressive to come from, but you know it takes all of us. It takes all of us as Americans to make this work. And we're we're putting, we're trying to put our shoulder to the wheel and 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 get as much support as we can. If you can help us, and if you can write a check for us, we'll get leverage. It's tax deductible, and and it will help us carry this forward. Thank you. I have to say, Jay works. Um, pro bono. He, he, he works for free um, and, and works very hard and he believes in this. Um, so what we're asking you to do is share information, be willing to write letters to legislators, thank you letters to Representative Murray and others who've supported us. Um, go ahead and ask your senators. I understand that Neil Hunt and Josh Stein who represent and, and Senator Blue who represent most of Wake County are in favor of this, but they need a push. Um, just think about your teenager and what it takes to get them to clean up their room. In, in my house, it was always the mention of a car, but you know, if you can come up with something equivalent to that, when, when you're talking to your senator, that's a good thing. Um, Jane, do you mind if I say something like that? Sure. Um, I just wanted, you know, cards and emails and letters are really great, but. We have some really good representatives, especially in Wake County, who if you ask them to, will come and speak to groups. Um, Representative Murray and Representative Horn came out to our school last year. Rep um, Mr. Gukan and Representative Stam came out to our school this year and spoke. And sometimes all it takes is them asking. Representative Horn actually said, I love doing this, but not enough people ask me. I'll go as often as I can. So if you have a, a good, effective legislator, someone who's going to compromise and listen to their constituents, they are going to try to make those, uh, those opportunities happen for you where they'll come and talk to people, which is so much more effective, I'm sure, than, <laughs> than reading an email. So. <clears throat> that, that's actually an excellent point. And if any of you have other groups that you think would like to have a meeting like this, would like to, to get involved, um, we'll help you organize it. We'll help get representatives. We'll get other, other people of interest to come to any organization that you think would like to have a meeting like this. So that's another way that you could help. Could you end? Representative Murray, just say 10 words of what kind of citizen input is most valuable and appreciated by you. What's the best way to get in touch with somebody who is in the seat? Because I think from a citizen standpoint, we get stuff by email all the time, sign a petition that's about 8,000, and you think, yeah, but that's not personal. What, what, what is more? The more personal, the better. Now that's, do you want to stand up, Representative Murray, so everybody can hear you? <laughs> uh, we got a little issue going on with Jordan Lake right now. I'm sure you're all aware of this as well. I'm getting hundreds of emails where I can't reply back to the constituent. I have to actually send a letter in order for me to reply back to the constituent. And so it's, 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 it's very ineffective for the advocacy group that's pushing these emails. And I'm actually on their side trying to communicate back to these constituents. And I can't even reply to their email. I have to print a letter off and put a stamp on it. And that takes you know, staff time and all that. So a, a, a personal, out, personal outreach uh, and, a very, and, a, and a telling a story, how, how, how redistricting in, this would impact um, if you come from another state like many of us have, but very few locals are, are in western Wake County. That's why it's one of the fastest growing areas. If you've got a story about how they did it in your state and 
how how it had helped competitive elections and how you had better representation in your opinion because of the competitive elections. I don't have to. They, you can't draw a district in Western Wake County without making it competitive. I'm in a competitive election every two years. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that because it keeps me honest, and I get a chance to talk to several thousand people every 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 two years. I'll knock on your door. We'll talk. That's okay. That's the way it's supposed to work. I don't have any problem doing that. That's what I got to do to retain my seat. I'm okay with that. And if and elected officials that aren't okay with that, they need to get replaced. Is there uh, any reason that the House would not want to just pass this bill and present it to the Senate so that we have it on their doorstep? To have we, we check the box. It's yeah. Done. Yeah. It's already yeah, there. That's, yeah. Check that box. 88 votes sent it over to the Senate months Sorry. ago. All right. It's, it's teed up. Since we did it in, in 2011. Yes. Yeah. Really how, yeah. how to approach the Senate. The question is how to approach the Senate. And, and I think the message that Representative Murray is giving you is pick up the phone. Um, when they come back in May, come down to the General Assembly, call your legislators and say, if I get 10 of your constituents together, can we have coffee? Um, you know, and uh, honestly, another argument that I've heard, uh, this is uh, talking about arguments against, well, that's, we don't have to worry about that until 2020. Okay. Yeah. And think about it. Yeah, you're right. That's when your district unit is coming up. And so my fear, though, is when, when the closer we get to 2020, then we'll say, all right, we'll pass it in 2019 and for 2030. <laughs> and I, if I, if, if that is actually what happens, everybody in here needs to buy me a coat because I'm making a shot. I'm calling my shot. I'm calling my shot. That's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to pass redistricting reform in 2019 or 2030. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just calling my shot. Representative, are you interested in a statute or a constitution? Personally, I think it needs to be in the constitution. That's just me. But I'll take what I can get. But personally, I think it needs to be in the constitution. The constitution's a little bit harder to change. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you change? You get to change it. Yeah. We, we had three fifths majority in both chambers for, for a ballot initiative, and then it gets to go on the ballot, and everybody in the district gets a chance at it. So it's the same bottleneck. You've got to get three fifths in the Senate, mm -hmm. which you can't do. Sure, so sure. I mean, it. Go around that or, yeah. No, yeah, no the, yeah. you, don't want, you don't want the Constitution, you don't want amending the Constitution to be an easy thing. No. You want three fifths, mm -hmm. trust me. Yeah, and the other point on that, too, if I could, just, you know, let's assume, you know, envision, if, if you would, that we do that, that we get it through the House, we get it through the Senate, we get a constitutional amendment on the ballot. Then another important part of that is to make sure that it is on the ballot during one of the major elections so that, you know, you have as many people participate. Yeah, presidential, presidential general election is the year that you want to do it. So, again, that kind of sets our, you know, if you think in those terms, that kind of sets our time frame, too, of when this needs to be done because what you don't want to do is you don't want to have something this important on an off ballot year when the voter turnout is low anyway you want as many people to participate in this as you possibly can so that would be my ideal as well okay go ahead my question has to do with the initiative and, and referendum i come from states that have those and i understand north carolina does not has there ever been an effort to get the initiative petition or the referendum as a constitutional amendment in the North Carolina Constitution? It seems to me that there, there are many things that the people would like to, ch to change, but they don't have the leverage to do it. And if you got those in the Constitution, the voters would have more options. Has that ever come up in North Carolina that? Not my memory. Not, not to my knowledge. It's created a lot of problems in California. That's what I'm going to say. I will say, I lived in California when Proposition 13 passed, which set a limit on uh, property taxes, and, and that's why they're in, in financial trouble. Um, before everybody leaves, I want to... Oh, fantastic. If you will just even give us your name and your email, we would appreciate that. Representative Murray, let's officially thank you. which took a lot of guys, so he really deserves your time.
Thank you. District, write in the thank you note, and if you have questions, tell him thank you tonight. Or tell him thank you now, and we'll be happy to answer questions one on one. Say hello to spoke on the phone. From December 11th, 2013, this has been VoterRadio.com's coverage of a discussion on redistricting reform in North Carolina, presented by the North Carolina Coalition for Lobbying and Government Reform. To learn more about that coalition, please visit nclobbyreform.org. <laughs>